part two, philosophy now, further analysis and discussion. Do you want to start with your question? Sure. Um, so, Rick, we're just going to ask you a couple of questions that are kind of taking some of the philosophical content we've talked about and relating it to um, like modern issues that are in the media at the moment and trying to apply some of the philosoph philosophical kind of theories and feel free to drop any ones you want. Okay, so the first question was about something that happened in the media recently that I think is quite an interesting example and can be phrased into a, a sort of thought experiment. So for those not aware, um, last week the UK government, the French government and the American government uh, bombed Syria. Uh, this was due to a chemical attack that the Syrian government apparently inflicted on its own people. And I think this raises a really interesting philosophical and ethical question because this attack uh, by the French, British and American governments was done quite quickly. And in the UK, it was done without a vote in Parliament. And the reason I'm posing this is because we actually did it in our school debate club on Thursday, which is that, Rick, do you think that military action, which can have, you know, quite uh, impactful results on people, um, you know, resulting in loss of life, etc. Do you think that those sorts of actions should be put forward without a vote in Parliament? In general, definitely not. Uh, however, I can imagine there are circumstances when military action is pointless unless taken immediately. Um, so therefore, Parliament might want to grant, um, or the law might want to grant a general uh, permission for a government to act immediately without reference back to Parliament under those circumstances, although the circumstances themselves would have to be quite clearly uh, described um, when, when giving that kind of permission. Uh, and obviously, there would also have to be uh, debate afterwards by Parliament of whether the government had used that power delegated by Parliament um, responsibly and uh, correctly. I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate because it's fun. Uh, so how would you respond then if someone said that, OK, so having a vote before is essential in a case in, in of emergency? Um, how how someone may say, OK, but the democratic process is very slow, very arduous in terms of this vote. You know, it, it could take it could take potentially days uh, and then you might get the vote that, that, you know, you should do it anyway, in which case you've just lost it a couple of days. You've lost some time there. Do you feel like there's strong arguments kind of for and against this? I mean, is there maybe a danger if if the government has a veto over what Parliament says, if they can just perform military action straight away, um, you know, taking the Syrian conflict out of it for a second? Or philosophically, do you think that maybe government should have this power in an emergency? Um, well, let's see. What's what's the best we could manage if they don't have this power? If Supposing Parliament decides as it might. It says, no, you can under no circumstances... Uh, launch military action um, without a vote in Parliament first. If you do that, you've done something very naughty for which you'll be in a lot of trouble. You know, uh, presumably it, it would be possible for a Parliament to pass a law to that effect. Um, so supposing they did that, they say, OK, right, now everything has to be run past file Parliament before uh, anyone fires a shot. Um, what's the fastest way we can do that? In that case, I think parliamentarians would be asking to be treated like doctors on call. Mm. Um, well, that's probably an unfortunate analogy, doctors save lives. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> okay, the urgency would be there. All right. Uh, we think we've got to launch a military action tomorrow morning. Uh, you press a buzzer. Everyone tumbles out of their different beds all over Britain. Um, and they, they rush to their screens uh, from which they're, they, they've been authorized to, to place a, a vote. And mm. there's a debate. And then there's a vote. You, you could make it fa fast-ish, but even then there's a problem, uh, which is that um, uh, these military actions tend to be done on the basis of, of uh, intelligence, um, and um, the, the, the people currently making the decisions have access to that intelligence. You'd have to share that intelligence uh, very fast and in, in quite a lot of depth uh, with all these people and get them to, to read up on this uh, very, very quickly. Maybe it could be done, um, um, but uh, there's, there's, there's practical problems in doing it. Just another, I'm going to ask another question about politics here as well before I move on to, I wanted to ask a question about uh, philosophy in, in sort of pop culture. But the, in concerning politics with, and I'm going to use the Brexit debate here as a, as an example, uh, without being too political, but the, d do you think that philosophy could have helped if, 
there was like a better discourse about what the public were actually voting for. So whether or not there were like leaving or remaining was the right answer. But do you think that the discourse up to the referendum was actually useful? Do you think that actually if there would have been a more philosophical approach to the way in which these ideas were discussed that the general public would have had a better sense about exactly what they were voting for. This is perhaps in light of the fact that we we have now received quite a lot of information past the referendum, which suggested that actually a lot of people didn't quite know exactly what they were voting for in the first place. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's the case. Um, okay, there, there's some things I can say, you know, with, with, with some sort of facts to back them up and there's there's others where, where obviously i can only speak on the basis of the impressions i have something I, I say on the basis of just the impressions i have from that time are that actually the general public did better in terms of discussing these issues than um a, a lot of the, the the public discussion by mm. journalists and commentators in the media uh, because uh, of the nature of the campaigns it's like you had two campaigns talking one past one another Neither really wanted to talk about the the other campaign's strong areas. They they both wanted to talk of for obvious um, tactical reasons about their own strong areas. Uh, away from that space, you you've you've got people discussing with one another and talking about the strong points of both campaigns and having arguments about it and weighing the pros and cons like adults are meant to do. Well, on the one hand, we do this. On the other hand, this is a drawback and so on. I think that the, the private discourses that people had were probably better than the public discourse. Um, yeah, and what's interesting, sorry, I just, just uh, uh, in terms of why people voted, the, the, the ways that they did, uh, people have, have, have um, speculated about that endlessly. They've, they've, and they've, they've stated confidently that people voted this way for this reason or that way for that reason. They've applied sociology, they've applied psychology, they've applied economics to explain uh, this. Mm. But I'm not quite sure why they've, they've, they've done that so much because we have the figures. Um, there was a, a massive poll conducted by the Ashcroft organization, I believe, on, on the day of the referendum, asking people, like, how did you vote? And what were your top reasons for voting that way? And these are easily accessible online. And if you look at those figures, you can see that the, the, the people who, who voted leave and the people who voted remain, you know, it's, it's, um, they, 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 they were worried about completely different things. The people who voted remain, almost all of them were worried about economics. No, not all of them, but a very large majority were, were mainly worried about different economic aspects of it. The ones who, who voted leave uh, were in different ways uh, saying that what they wanted to do was take back control. Some said in general, uh, oh, we just want to take back control of lawmaking. I think that was 49% or so. Some said mm -hmm. we want to take back control of something specific like uh, immigration. I think that was like 30 something percent. Some said uh, we want more control over the way things develop in the future. And we, we don't think we have control over the way the EU is developing. That's another percentage. And then there were a few who said, oh, we think it'd be best for the economy. But that's like 5% or so. It's like you talk two bunches of people talking totally past one another again. I guess I just want to ask about the maybe the merits of do you do you think holding a referendum on such a complicated matter is actually and this is a political philosophical ph philosophical question here, which is that do do these things need to be done by people who are perhaps like in Plato's sense, like they're like really well informed. They know about as much as you could possibly know about making predictions on this. Or do we open this up to the public? Was, was should this have ever been something that the general public voted on as a whole? Okay. Well, the short answer is I don't know, but I'm happy to talk around it a bit more if you, if you want. Yeah. I, I first heard the argument a long time ago. Um, 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 someone asking Anthony Flew in, in a meeting about um, a, 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 a philosophical topic, but somehow he, he was saying, well, there should be a referendum on, on membership of the European Union. And they were saying, well, it's far too complicated. There's so many different factors involved. You can't ask the public to, to wrestle with this. And he was saying, well, well, you know, um, yes, you can. The, the, the decisions that they make in a normal general election are actually more complicated because they've got more choices on the ballot paper, not just two. And th there's a lot more different policy areas involved. It's, it's, it's more complex. So I thought that was quite a good point. Um, however, uh, it's also true that if you, if you elect uh, a parliament full of people that you think 
are basically good people and represent your viewpoint you know uh, you, you vote for someone who you think is going to represent roughly your your approach to politics those people are, are as individuals um going to be or at least should be better involved better better informed about the specifics of a choice like being in the eu or not than than random members of the population so a, a final question on for you know philosophy now in the contemporary society uh, students are asked to analyze the view of secular humanists in the new ocr a level and would you consider yourself a secular humanist first of all yes i would yes and in short, this is the view that Christian belief is personal and should play no part in public life. Would you agree with this? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Yes. So so what are your views on the current status of religion in our society in the UK? I mean, should it have um, the privileges that it has in the education system, in terms of faith schools or in terms of in terms of its role in, in government decision making? OK, um. I think I'd perhaps slightly like to revise uh, my uh, answer to what I said just a moment ago <laughs> when uh, I said that it shouldn't play any part in public life. Uh, that sounds a bit strong, actually. Uh, we're talking about religion in um, education, in schools, and clearly a lot of uh, schools have a religious foundation or background or are sponsored by a religion. Um, and uh, convey the ideas of that religion. I don't think that any school should be allowed to con convey uh, a set of religious ideas uncritically without uh, uh, laying out uh, other options, other possibilities. But um, I don't think it's necessarily wrong for a, a school which has a strong religious basis to say, well, look, this is, this is uh, what uh, your teachers uh, believe, this is what we as a school feel is a, a good um, uh, thing, uh, mm -hmm. a good set of uh, uh, ethics, um, a good approach to theology, um, but we'll also tell you about the other stuff too. I think that's all right. I think that's all right. What, what I'm worried about a bit is um, where schools which are actually funded by the taxpayers, by, by the government, um, uh, are then because of a, a religious connection, then in, in, in that position and perhaps take it a bit further and say, well, uh, if the parents don't share our religion, then the, the children either can't go to the school or, or, or face bigger barriers to going to the school than otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think if you take taxpayers' money, then uh, that's, that, that changes the whole game, really. In that case, your school should be open to all equally, and uh, the possibilities for, for prioritizing your own religious view should be perhaps less. Yeah, I just wanted to say, because uh, we talked about schools, but if, if the Church of England, say, have bishops in the House of Lords, what, what do you think is the, the view on uh, like religion involved with politics in that sense? Yeah, I really don't get the thing with uh, there being bishops in the House of Lords. It seems like a double representation in a way. Um, the, um, mm, of course, the, the House of Lords is, is pretty screwy anyway. I mean, uh, uh, it's not elected at all. A lot of the people there are there because they've donated to polit particular political parties or are being rewarded for past services of that kind. Um, so to talk about representation at all is maybe a bit strange. But insofar as you can talk about representation, then having bishops in the House of Lords doesn't seem to me to be fair. Should we, is your prescription that we just, should we kick them out or do we replace them with a, 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 a gang of people from different religious people? I don't know why I chose gang, gang there. Um, a group a more diverse of people. group, Jack, <laughs> that would be better. Yeah. A diverse group of people from different religious views and, and humanists included as well. Well, seeing as you are asking, and this is, of course, naturally my view only and with the magazine doesn't have political views and so on and so on. I think you should kick mm. them all out. Not not just the bishops, but I mean, all of them, uh, the entire House of Lords. You should have a completely elected House of Lords uh, elected on a modern proportional representation system. And of course, it would be up to political parties who they wanted to put forward as candidates for such elections. And if they chose to put forward um, uh, um, um, clerics, if they, if they chose to put forward for imams or rabbis or bishops, then why not? You know, some of these people are, 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 you know, have thought very deeply about some of the problems facing our society, and I'd be all in favor of that. Absolutely. But let them be elected. 
I think you know, I just again I'm playing devil's advocate here because I somewhat agree with what you have to say. Uh, but surely somebody could respond to that and say that maybe if we put this up to election, that rhetoric would win the day, and that we would have these people that perhaps aren't particularly wise heads who would be put into the House of Lords, whose role is to kind of check uh, the House of Commons and the laws that are put through, and that if you have people that are elected in there, maybe they wouldn't do the job as well as people who have kind of feel it's their honor to represent the country as non-partisan uh, members. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. People do talk about the high quality of debate in the House of Lords. I haven't looked into it enough to really make a judgment on that. But I, I can imagine that what you're saying might be right. It might be that if you haven't got the pressure of, of worrying about re-election or whatever, then you're freer from uh, party pressures to make a decision on the issues. I mean, there are ways that that um, concern could be um, taken care of with, within an elected system. You could say something like, well, you're only going to be elected for one term and it's going to be a really long term, like eight years or 10 years or something like that. And then you're not going to get re-elected. So again, you'd, you'd have these people, they'd, they'd, they're in the House of Lords. They wouldn't have to worry about re-election because it wasn't going to happen. Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. Wonderful. Right. So it's called Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz, Rick. And we're playing, um, you're, you're our only contestant. For each one you get wrong, we get a point. And for each one you get right, you get a point. And we're going to play best out of five, okay? Okay. There's no money right on this, I hope. <laughs> You've caught me out. Yeah. So um, it's going to be Rick Lewis. So we've got quotations from Rick Ashley, the English singer, songwriter and radio personality. You have quotes from C.S. Lewis, the British novelist, poet, academic, medievalist, literary critic, essayist, lay theologian, broadcaster, lecturer and Christian apologist. And you've got quotes from Rick Lewis, the founder and editor of Philosophy Now magazine. OK, so I'm going <laughs> to give you, you a know your own quote. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you a quotation. You just simply have to guess out of these three people who the quote is from. There's confusingly similar names there. I see what you've done. There, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I want Rick Lewis or Rick Lewis as your answer so we know which one you, you're getting at. Um, we are what we believe we are. Well, I don't remember saying that. Um, so that, that helps enormously because now I've got a 50% chance. Um, I'm going to guess Rick Ashley. It's not Rick Ashley. That's C.S. Lewis. Rick Ashley would be very pleased with this news that he's getting it from a <laughs> different Lewis. Um, I do have a thing for eating out. That's one of life's great middle-aged pleasures. Oh, that was me. No, it's not. No, no, it wasn't me. No. Um, that's got to be Rick Ashley. I just can't imagine C.S. Lewis writing. <laughs> <laughs> that is Rick Ashley. Oh. Yes, that's Rick Ashley. <laughs> one or uh, I don't trust politicians. I think that by the time they've made it, with the concessions they've had to make in that position, I don't believe they still have the beliefs they had at the root. Yeah, uh, I'm going to guess C.S. Lewis for that one. That was Rick Ashley, actually. <laughs> really? That was Rick Ashley. That, that was, was Rick Ashley. Political. I didn't realise he was so political. <laughs> That's 2-1. Um, so we've got two left. Um, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Yeah, you know, I, I I remember writing something like that once. It might actually be me. I mean, that was C.S. Lewis. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> terrible. I'm doing terribly. Okay. Um. Okay. I'm not very good at predicting the future. I'm much better at predicting the past. That was me. That was you. Yes. Yeah, do you remember when you said this? No, I don't. It was in the past. Yeah, it was <laughs> you go living by your uh, by by what you taught um nothing is the one thing that doesn't need creating um i'm saying with more confidence than with any of the previous answers that it was c.s lewis this was you in a debate with uh, hamza andreas at tizoritz oh, tizoritz yes um a debate that you had whether or not God exists, and this was you from a, an audience question that was asked of you. Oh, okay. Well, wow. um, thank you. That was quite snappy. I should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I think I think we win the day, gentlemen. Uh, I'm sorry, Rick. You've uh, you've lost out here attributing Rick Ashley some fantastic quotes <laughs> and and the best ones which you've said yourself elsewhere to C.S. <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> 
Now, how could he be I've learned that Rick Ashley is the best philosopher of our <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. Rick Ashley just came out there on top. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we have a round of concluding remarks? Is that okay? Uh, do you mind if I start? Go, uh, for, go it. for it. So for me, thinking about philosophy in everyday life is a, is a well-cultivated habit, and it's something I've been doing since I can remember. I've never really been interested in anything else. And the aim of the podcast, we've always said, is to awaken free thinkers worldwide and inspire a new generation of them. And I'm overwhelmed by, the, by what we've done as a group. But I really hope we can encourage more people to engage in philosophy. And it's important to have these discussions again, to refresh on, on how we might do that and why that's important. I think if we cultivate free thinkers, uh, we avoid dan the dangers associated with a sheep mentality. And I think there's, we've got a shot at solving some of the problems we've discussed today, problems concerning the environment, our political discourse, and, and whether or not we should treat non-human animals in, in the way that we do. More fundamentally, though, I think, uh, Rick, earlier on, you're talking about philosophy being something fulfilling within itself and People that follow us on Twitter might have seen a, a, a very short interview I did, alumni, um, University of Birmingham interview, and I was asked as a final, um, final question, why are you so passionate about inspiring young people to get into philosophy? And I gave quite a, I think the sexiest response to this answer, which I could ever dream of giving. So I'm going to repeat it again, if that's okay. Uh, I said, the, the unexamined life is not worth living, and I want my students' lives to be worth living. And I guess Camus might turn over in his grave when I say this, but philosophy gives me a meaningful existence. It's the pursuit of truth that's enough to fill a man's heart. I think we should do everything that we can to encourage other people to go on this same, I guess, infinite journey without actually saying, oh, you've pushed the boulder up now. I think it's important to push other, get other people pushing boulders too. Well, my concluding remarks are going to be far less dramatic. <laughs> Rick, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Your enthusiasm for philosophy is tangible, and it's been wonderful to have, you know, yourself obviously promoting philosophy for many years through Philosophy Now, um, and us obviously with the Pan Psychast, you know, I think we're kind of just doing the same thing in different mediums, really, and it's been wonderful just to have a, a chat with you about some of the uh, important issues and, and what you think about philosophy. It's truly been a uh, just a great episode. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to repeat those same sentiments. Uh, thank you very much, Rick, for coming on and having a chat with us. Uh, and yeah, I think we're, we are trying to do the same thing. I mean, uh, being able to talk about philosophy as kind of a, a hobby and a job is just the best job that I would, and I wish I can continue doing it. I think the fact that you've dedicated so much of your life for trying to encourage other people to think is always an admirable thing in my eyes. Um, I've really enjoyed this discussion today. And I think uh, particularly getting across the fact that it is important in everyday life. Uh, ethics, politics is all stuff that everybody should care about. Rick, do you have any concluding remarks? Anything you want to finish on? Well, only that I'd like to say uh, that I think that uh, you know, with the Pan Psychast, you're, you're doing a great thing, all of you. It's fantastic. And um, that's why I was happy and, and flattered to be asked to take part. And it's been a real pleasure. It's been great talking with you. Thank you for listening to this uh, fantastic episode of the Pan Psycast. You can go to philosophynow.org to find out more about Philosophy Now. You can also follow Philosophy Now on Twitter. That's at Philosophy Now. Links to some videos which we've referenced about Rick are on our website. That's www.thepanpsychast.com. Uh, thank you for those who are supporting the show, supporting our community-based project. That's patreon.com forward slash panpsychast if you want to help support the show and get access to the after show, which we'll be recording now, and also the Kantian Cafe, Andrew's brilliant spin-off show. You can follow us on Twitter and get in touch at the panpsychast as well with any thoughts or suggestions for future episodes. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the beautiful, wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Oliver Marley. Thank you for listening. Mr. Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Mr. Rick Lewis. Thank you. And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. Thank you. <laughs>